Well, good morning. Good morning. This is a big day for us uh, at the Center for Leadership for a number of reasons. Uh, the first of which is we are glad to be back in person. Yeah. So. And we're glad that you are here today. Welcome. We're pleased to have you with us. My name is Nathan Hiller. I'm the executive director at the Center for Leadership and a professor in the College of Business. So to give you a little background, the leadership lectures were established in 2011. So we've been doing this for 12 years uh, and to date have brought more than 45 distinguished and world renowned speakers to FIU and our community. And today, of course, is no exception. I would like to thank the FIU Honors College for their continued support of the leadership lectures and thank all of the honors students with us today. Just by a show of hands, how many honors students are here with us today? Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> I would also like to recognize all active military and veterans who are here with us today. If I can ask you to please stand. Thank you for your service. Today, we host Admiral Craig Fowler as our featured Leadership Lecture Series speaker. Admiral Fowler is committed to helping organizations and individuals define leadership and build strong, trusted partnerships. As a retired four-star, an admiral, and for those of you who are less familiar with the military, there have been approximately 275 admirals in the history of the United States in the Navy. So, he is in certainly rarefied air in terms of position, but I can also tell you, having gotten a chance to know him over the last year and a half, he's an excellent, kind, and caring human being. He is recognized for his continuous dedication to leading large teams, managing military operations as the former commander of U.S. Southcom, uh, increasing global engagement, and improving national security and strategic development. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Admiral Craig Fowler. Thanks, appreciate it. Good morning and thank you for that warm welcome. And thank you, Nathan, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for coming out. I know it's Florida and uh, we'll probably get some more people straggling in. I'd like to thank the Leadership Center here. They do an exceptional job educating, training, and working with students, faculty, and the larger community here in Florida. They're the single largest source of education for the local school systems. And schools are our most important resource for the future. So thank you, Nathan, for your work at the Leadership Center. I'd like to thank FIU. I've been affiliated with FIU now for four years, three years as a commander at United States Southern Command right here in Doral. We gained tremendous benefit from the partnership with FIU. I really grew to respect what FIU stands for, its values, and really I think the mission statement of FIU, which is awesome, so simple, student success, student success. And I, I think FIU, I know FIU, thank you Mr. President for being here, President Jessel, uh, is, is focused and remains focused on student success. Okay, leadership lecture. I like the term leadership conversation because I think leadership is a two-way thing. So I'm gonna come down and have a conversation. We are all leaders, everyone, whether you want to be or not. Reluctantly, maybe you come to it with enthusiasm, but in some way or another, every one of us is a leader. So I want you to go with me, come with me on a journey out to sea aboard the United States Naval Ship Comfort. It's a hospital ship. The U.S. Navy has two, Comfort and Mercy, which I think are phenomenal names for ships. It's what we really want to do as a military. You think of the military, we think about tanks, Conflict, missiles, we have all that. Certainly we've got to be able to bring it. But what we really want to do is bring peace. We want to bring comfort. So the, this particular day, November 2018, and you're with me, come with me out to sea, 
We were on this ship, big ship. Ambassador Jean Maines is here with us today. She, was, she is the current deputy commander at United States Southern Command. She's on that ship. You're on that ship. It's a big ship, 900 some feet long, 900 hospital beds. A team of teams is aboard that ship. Doctors from Chile, Argentina, Mexico, the US, students, some military, but mostly volunteers. And we are off the coast of Colombia in the Caribbean, within sight of land, maybe just a mile off. It's a beautiful day. Seas calm, beautiful blue color. And we are tending to missions ashore and on the ship, treating people who have been just ravaged by the crisis in Venezuela. So just imagine people that need help, desperate help. Come with me. We're flying now in a helicopter ashore, a U.S. Army helicopter on a medical mission, and we land in a soccer field in a small village, pretty close to the Venezuelan border, but in Colombia amongst friends. And on this day, a scene I'll never forget, I come with the team. I, I was recognized as the leader of the team. I was just amongst many, and fortunate to have great people setting this up and making things happen. A mother comes up to me. She's got two boys with her. They're twins, maybe seven or eight years old. She starts speaking to me in Spanish, and I'm a big believer in learning, but my journey on learning Spanish has been a long and, and slow one. So. I do tell her no habla espanol, and I uh, do have an interpreter. Uh, she wants to thank me. She's walked miles, miles, many miles from Venezuela to come to this medical site to seek hope in a better life. And her two little boys are so happy they've never been to a doctor, ever. Dentist, ever. She'd never been And they were there to get help. And we, this team of teams, provided them hope. You know, I learned more about leadership from two little boys and a mother like that than many of the classes I've taken in over the years. You see, leadership's a two-way thing. What causes a mother to walk and endure all the hardships? It's love. It's love for those boys. It's hope for a better future which we all want. That's why we're in school. And then those boys, where they had every reason to just be down and out, they were up and happy and grateful. You learn a lot about leadership when you can learn about the gratitude that's inherent in love. Those two little boys taught me a lot about leadership. We are all leaders. And to me, the ethos of leadership is that leadership is love. But I'll tell you, it didn't just come to me like a lightning bolt one day. So I want you to go with me on another journey out to sea. This time, we're in the North Atlantic in February. And it is rough. It is not beautiful blue. It is gray. The ocean is often very gray. The sea's gray. Sky is gray. When it goes from night to day, it just goes from dark gray to lighter gray. And the wind's blowing so hard that it's blowing the water sideways, it feels like it's raining, and it's cold. It is Valentine's Day, 1993. Valentine's Day, 1993. So I'm a sort of mid-grade officer, about 10 years in the military at this point. I made the decision to stay in. Now, now work with me here. You're on that ship with me. You're feeling it. Rough. It's pitching. I know this is not a good recruiting commercial for the United States Navy, but you got to work with me. There's a lot of blue water and calm seas out there, too. And you're just holding on. And, um, who's been to sea and experienced rough weather? You don't feel like eating. I get seasick. Yes, I know admirals aren't supposed to admit that, but I do. I get seasick, and, uh, and you're just holding on. On the bridge of a ship, that's where you drive the ship from, called the bridge, there's these cables that run across. They're not there to hold the ship together. They're there to hold on when it's rough. So, Valentine's Day, 1993, and my position 
is the operations officer on this ship, so kind of encompasses a lot of things, about 300 people on the ship. I'm working directly for the commanding officer. The commanding officer runs the ship. And I'm up, it's about five in the morning, and I'm holding on to these cables. And I'm just thinking about the next minute. I, it's too, I want a cup of coffee, but I can't even fathom drinking it because I got to be two hands on that cable. I'm not even thinking about eating, and I'm thinking a little bit about sleeping, but I'm worried that when I get down to my bed, we call them racks on ships, racks, not beds, and a lot of lingo in the Navy. I know I've learned universities have their own lingo too. So uh, I'm not even thinking about sleep. I'm thinking about how much I miss home, which is try not to think about that, but who can't on Valentine's Day? All of a sudden behind me, I hear the commanding officer of the ship. I, we loved the captain, but he was a tough, high standards, demanding person. He never got seasick either. I hear him, morning ops, what's going on? I, look, I turn around, he's not holding on with two hands. He's got a cup of coffee in one hand. I don't condone smoking, but his cigarette in the other. And he's just standing there like it's the uh, nicest day in the world. He goes, what's going on this morning, Ops? And it's like he's gyro-stabilized this man. <laughs> Man's name is James A. Woods, Jr. It's a great name, Jaw. Um, and so I'm about to give him an update on what's been happening all night. Not much. It's rough. He gets it. And he, he cuts me off. He goes, I got a question for you, Ops. Operations officer, nickname, call sign, Ops. Yes, sir. Takes a cup of coffee. Meanwhile, he said, why'd you stay in the Navy? I'm like, seriously? My head hurts. I haven't slept in days. I miss my family. It's Valentine's Day. We're one week into a six-month deployment. We're headed to the Middle East. This is still, we're still uh, fighting Saddam. And I'm like, seriously, you're going to hit me with that kind of existential question today? Oh, this is not an honors leadership course. Okay, all right, I'll bring it. I'll bring it, boss. Okay, boss. I love winning teams. I grew up near Pittsburgh. We had the Steelers, Pirates, Penguins. Well, the Pirates weren't always bad. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, I love, now I'm in the United States Navy, world's winningest team ever for navies. He takes a sip of coffee. He goes, that's all BS, all BS. I'm like, seriously, how can that be a, a wrong answer? It's my answer. You don't want to be, you know, it's, what's wrong with that? Who, who doesn't deny that being on winning teams is fulfilling, I think. You know, maybe you like being on a losing team. I never did. So he goes, you'll figure it out one day, and he goes and sits down. So I was a little bit, I was a little bit miffed. At that point, 10 years in the Navy, I was feeling a little, perhaps, full of myself, had a little bit of confidence, maybe overconfidence. I tried to revisit that conversation with him multiple times. He would just say, I'm having none of it. You'll figure it out someday. Time goes on. We part our ways on that ship in a good manner. I'm selected seven years or so later for my own ship. And over time, I learned, I began, I really thought about that question all the time because I was challenged to my beliefs. I don't think it was wrong to say winning teams, but it wasn't from the heart. So before I was about to go to command a ship of, that was going to be my own in terms of being in charge, I called Jim up. I said, Jim, sir, I think I figured this out. I want to run it by you. He goes, oh, what do you got? I said, sir, it's about love. It's about love. He said, leadership to me is about love, professional love. It's about the mission. For us, the military, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies. It's about the people, what we stand for, and what we do. Not perfect, but working hard every day to be good. He goes, you got it. I'm proud of you. You figured it out. You know, Jim Woods was a mentor. All of us need mentors. Leadership is not an alone thing. It's a two-way thing. Those boys... Jim Woods, mentors. Mentors can come in all forms. Jim Woods challenged me. Mentors, good mentors, challenge you. Jim Woods saw something in me at an early stage in my career that I probably didn't see in myself. Jim Woods, by not even talking about, hey, go figure it out, define leadership, he was 
making me think deeply about leadership. A lifelong journey of learning. Define leadership. So my question for you, how are you defining leadership if we're all leaders? It may be leadership is love, but it's got to be yours. you got to own it from the heart. you got to own it. I went on to command a ship, the USS Steedham. It's not spelled like it's pronounced. It's S-T-E-T-H-E-M. It was named after an enlisted sailor, petty officer second class. So second class petty officer is an E-5. So not about four or five years in the Navy. It was named after a, a, a junior sailor, petty officer second class Robert Dean Steedham. I never met him. Never will. He'd, he'd be about my age. I guess that makes him old, but if he was alive today. But he was brutally killed by Lebanese Hezbollah terrorists and pushed off a plane onto the tarmac in Beirut in 1985. Because of his courage, his convictions, and his steadfast adherence to the ideals of this country over the course of a multi-day a brutalization by these terrorists, the U.S. Navy named a ship after him. Petty Officer Steedham is a mentor to me, and I never met him. You can have mentors from books, from history, by studying and learning and thinking about what that example means to you and your life. The crew on that ship became mentors to me. And, and taking that philosophy, that ethos of leadership is love, and applying it day in and day out on yet another deployment, another time away from my, my wife, Martha, who's here with me today, I learned from them the value of trust in leadership. So if leadership is love and, and leadership is something that we, we are, then how do you make it work? So how do you build trust in yourself and in others? And, and I think trust is the currency of leadership. But Petty Officer Steedham exhibited all that without even talking about leadership or trust. I mean, when he paid the ultimate sacrifice, character goes into trust, character. I mean, that doesn't mean you don't make mistakes, but that means you work day in and day out to, to be good and ethical, doing the right thing for the right reason. Steedham was all that. Competence. People think about, okay, I get it, I'm an honorable person, trust me. But you gotta know your job, and you gotta do your job to be trusted. You're not gonna be trusted. I wouldn't trust you to run it, to, to drive the ship if you didn't know how to do it, and you weren't competent at that. Competence is an important piece of trust. It doesn't mean you're the master of the universe. It means you're working hard at being good in your job, as well as your character. And commitment, another important piece. I mean, Robbie Steedham, Petty Officer Steedham, was committed to the ideals of this country. The terrorists wanted him just to say simply, no, nah, the country's on the wrong course or something like that. He didn't, he wouldn't. He stayed committed. Great saying we have in the Navy, it's called don't give up the ship. Well, it's easy not to give up the ship on a really nice day when you're out in the Caribbean and the seas are flat, but how about when you're going through a storm? Every one of us is going through some kind of storm. There's not a single person I know in my own self looking in the mirror that is not experiencing that flat blue waters of the Caribbean every day. So how do you deal with those storms of life? You gotta hold on with two hands, but you also gotta think and you gotta lean on others. Your mentors, your friends, you can't go through this alone. Leadership is two-way, it's multi-way. Trust, character, competence, commitment. And then communicating that. Steedham communicated. Robbie Steedham, Petty Officer Steedham, who was a quiet, petty officer, good individual, but not, not, not going to get up and, and give a talk about himself. Who wants to? He communicated through his actions. You know, the expression, actions speak louder than words. So trust. So my question for you is, how are you defining your leadership and what's that currency of that leadership? It's hard to argue that trust might not be in that equation somewhere. And how are you assessing your journey on that path? Uh, Robbie Steedham could look in the mirror if he, if he was, and he could say, hey, my eyes are locked on. People trust me. 
Who trusts you? It's not about you. It's about the who. It's about the team. It's about others. Petty Officer Steedham, a mentor. August 2021. My wife Martha and I are having coffee together on a Saturday here in South Florida. Commanding a wonderful team of United States Southern Commands just up the road a little bit. Service members, civilians, ambassadors, all working together to try to build security in this great hemisphere of ours, this neighborhood of potential and prosperity. And we're planning our day. It's Saturday, it's a day off. We're planning our walk, we're looking at the weather. When is the daily storm gonna hit, right? Wanna go early, but we don't wanna go too early. And, uh, and you all know it's, it's August, South Florida. We're also doing a little deeper look at the Weather Channel, whatever your source is, to see what the storm situation's like out there, how many days the next hurricane waves out. At Southcom, that matters because we respond, first respond to those hurricanes in, in supporting our friends in the region. The phone rings. It's the Joint Operations Center at United States Southern Command. So this is a group of folks 24-7 are monitoring things and they're in touch with all our embassies, all the partner nations. They say, Admiral, there has been a massive 7.2 magnitude earthquake in Haiti. Like, okay, not going for a walk today. Thousands of buildings destroyed, massive destruction. First report, more to follow. Put the phone down, I thank them. I'm going to work, and we go to work. Ambassador Maines and I go to work. Team goes to work. State Department goes to work. Haiti's a tough place. The last thing Haiti needed was another, another hit like they had the two, 2010 earthquake of the same magnitude that killed over 200,000 people. But we knew, no, we knew we needed to move fast. And we tried. We tried to bring hope. Everybody needs hope. Days later, we were flying a mission that, that I attended to. I wanted to go down and I didn't want to be in the way of my team, but I wanted to go down and see for myself the situation. We were with Ambassador Power, the head of US aid, Samantha Power, and we were flying a mission. That they, Nickname for the area is the Southern Claw. It's a peninsula, and the epicenter of this earthquake was in the middle of that peninsula. And the death tolls were in the thousands. Total devastation, almost every building knocked to the ground. We were in a small village. We landed again on a soccer field, about the only place there wasn't debris and rubble. And we walked over to the edge of the village, and there was a, a lady an older lady sitting on a, a plastic chair. She's just sitting there and she wanted to share our, her story with us. See, she had been days before under the building that no longer exists right next to her chair. She called over a, a cousin who had uh, dug her out from underneath that building. She had tears in her eyes and he had tears in his eyes and they were the lucky ones they survived. And you say to yourself, what causes a person to risk their own life in the midst of aftershocks to dig a lady out from underneath the rubble when very much not sure what he's going to find and risk your own life? And then what, what can we do, we, the bigger we, to help a nation recover, move forward, and have hope? And I know what causes that person to do that. It's the same thing that causes that mother to walk all the way to that medical site. It's love. It's the love of your fellow human being. It's the love of something bigger than yourself, not yourself. And it's respecting yourself enough to know that you can do this. You've got to love yourself too. And we helped as best we could a situation which remains fragile in Haiti. I learned a lot of, from that lady that day about leader, leadership, about the importance of gratitude in leadership. 
about the importance of action in leadership. So you see, for me, defining leadership is leadership is love. It was never ever as simple as coming up with that formula. There's a lot of learning, a lot of mistakes. The currency for me, but it's got to be for you. It's got to be from your heart. It's trust. But it's all been learned from others, like those boys and that lady and former boss, Jim Woods, and my wife, my dad, another one of my mentors. So you, got this, you build this trust through knowing your job, doing your job, competence, doing the right thing, character, staying with it when it gets tough, commitment. But then you got to do something with it, right? you got to make a difference. And that's really how I define communication, making a difference. It's a great book about trust. It's uh, written by Stephen Covey. Maybe some of you heard about it. Speed of Trust, 14 variables. Now look, I already told you I'm from Western Pennsylvania and I drew ship, drove ships my life. I can never remember more than three or four things. So I, I, I kind of boiled that down to character, competence, commitment. But the doing something with it is what's critical. What are you going to do with your skills, your leadership? Make a difference, right? We all want to make a difference. Maybe it's big like helping Haiti after an earthquake and Maybe it's big, but maybe it's just an act of kindness. Maybe it's just being kind to yourself, being a little more tolerant of your own mistakes and willing to move forward off on those mistakes. That's how we learn. Leadership is love. Define it for yourself. Come up with a currency. Can't be trust, but you gotta dig into it. You gotta trust yourself first and then really trust others and make Make a reason for why people would want to trust you. I've shared a few stories. I've taken you to sea on some calm waters and some rough waters and maybe sparked a question or two. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to move into some questions. So thanks for listening today and thanks for your time. Thanks for coming. Wow. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you. So we're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, we're going to have a brief discussion here. I'm going to ask a few questions. And then uh, you may be formulating or thinking about questions that you might want to ask. We'll bring some mic stands up. And in a few minutes, uh, you'll have a chance to, uh, to ask some questions. So um, the, uh, there's so many things going through my, th through my mind on it. I think it's just really incredibly powerful. Uh, so many, so many pieces of what you said. And I, I, I love the fact that there's this almost dissonance between this idea that military, we got a senior military leader telling us that leadership is love. Uh, and I think in a pretty compelling way. So boy, I, I, I'm going to be marinating on that for a while. And I hope, I hope you will too. Um, in some of our previous conversations, uh, I learned a little bit around uh, some of the work that you did in managing and in, in leading through managing by ensuring that people weren't overburdened and some of the questions you would ask them. Could you talk a little bit about that to how you'd ensure that people actually had a break? That's a, I mean, I, who doesn't think they're busy, right? Um, and we, uh, we take on a lot of things. We try to accomplish a lot. Never seems to be enough time in a day. Never going to make more than 24 hours. I think you can if you fly around the world in the right direction. You could conceivably gain some time, but I wouldn't recommend that. And so now prioritization becomes really important, really important. And something that we all work hard at, that's a positive way of saying many of us struggle with it, prioritization. And so one way that I have learned over time to work through that is, what is it that I have to do? that only I can do. Only I can do it. So I mean, I, only I can say good morning and be nice to my wife and friends in the morning. I can't delegate that. If I do, it'd be pretty weird and it won't work so well. I wouldn't stay married for 39 years mm -hmm. now, probably. But you can fit that, what is it only I can do, into many, many examples. And so as you're leading a team, maybe it's a small group for a project where it's more by consensus, 
you sort of have to work through that and where do your talents fit versus where others' talents fit. If you're leading an organization or part of an organization, it can be complicated, but it is also a useful question to ask because I think many of us take on things, too many things ourselves because we know that we can do it. I, I, well, if I know if I move this table to there, it'll go exactly where I want it. A far too simple example. Uh, but as a leader, and a leader of an organization at any level, I think the more you empower your team, the less you do actively, the better off you'll be in the long run. It takes a level of patience. It also has to be, you have to have a collaborative process where you involve people early enough in projects or ideas so that you can take their input. And if you don't listen to their input, or at least give them feedback as to why the input wasn't accepted or worked on, then over time you'll never get any input again and you'll be doing everything yourself. So it's sort of this idea of active listening, which is very challenging and, and difficult for all of us, I think. So, so then how There's do you balance in that? And, and how do you balance that? So you have to prioritize, figure out what you can delegate, but make sure people aren't overloaded. Like I remember you telling me a story that you would walk around and say, what do you have going on on Fridays? Like what's going on, what's burning right now, and who needs to step in to make sure you're not working all weekend? I thought that was just no, incredibly powerful, just those check-ins. Do you want to maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit? The story that um, Nathan refers to, at a point in my career, I was the director of operations at United States Central Command. So the way the U.S. Department of Defense has organized the globe is in these combatant commands, we call them, but they're, they're teams that have responsibility for regions of the globe to build mill-to-mill -mill relations, respond to disasters, or fight wars if we're in them. So this is Central Command, so this is Middle East. At this point, we're fighting in Yemen. We're working to contain and deter Iranian terrorism. We have an ongoing conflict in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. Now I'm director of operations for, at the time, General Jim Mattis, and everything was, had to be a priority because lives were being lost and we we're at really in a global war here. And so our team was very worn out, tired, 600 people in the operations department. So what do we do? We can't just say we're not gonna work on the weekends, but what we would say on Wednesday, we came to, I, I came to start asking, okay, what are we working on right now that, that is going to spill over into the weekend that is not essential? So let's not create any new work. Let's only focus if we have to on a crisis that would make, bring us in. So they say, no, somebody would say, well, we gotta get this done by Friday. No, we're not gonna do that because it won't get done by Friday and you'll be working on Saturday. We're just not gonna do that till next week. So I started asking a question on Wednesday. What's, what's gonna cause us to work extra over the weekend that's not a priority item? And, and it became a good, a mantra for the, the team. Also, it was a little bit of self-talk for me, so I didn't have to work all weekend. <laughs> I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of people, probably even in the audience, who would appreciate if their boss would actually ask them that question, right? And, and, and help them figure out hey, look, how to manage their workload. So I, I just thought I'll that tell was you fantastic. That yeah. Part of this <clears throat> building competence is hard work. Nothing yep. important ever gets done the easy way. It's always hard work. Hard work is essential. Hard work and teamwork. I, I sometimes refer to those as the work brothers and sisters. Hard work and teamwork go hand in hand. Sometimes hard work requires work, and sometimes work requires uh, not respecting an eight-hour day. But you want to make sure that it's essential to the to what needs to get done. Great. When um, so I want to shift gears a little bit. When we at at one point when we originally sort of floated this idea with you, I remember. Um, you had a, um, a reaction when, we, talk, when we, we were talking about you know, maybe giving a lecture, or giving a talk like this. And when, I love the way you frame that too. Like it's a lecture, but no one wants to hear a lecture. How about a conversation, right? So um, you had, uh, and, and from getting to know you, you talked about the central role that your spouse plays in some of the key decisions and determining how you would take on big roles. Do you want to t talk a little bit about that? And so you'd even said, maybe we'll do something like this together. So, you know, that it would, the two of you would be up here or something like that. And I, I just, I was struck by the, this, 
the centrality, Martha, of, of, uh, that, that was very evident uh, in my conversations, uh, in my conversations with JC. Well, I mentioned in my in the conversation that Martha's a mentor of mine, my love, and, and I go to her to, it's not really key decisions at work. It's more about how to approach things and just help me think through this, even just how to approach talking about leadership before every, every session. Today, we spent some time going over things and just stories and how you would tell a story. So I, I think it helps, it helps with the understanding, it helps with the delivery, it helps with the communication. So I think it's, you know, whether it's your spouse or your friend or coworker, those kind of relationships are really important in life. How do you know, um, this, this will be my, uh, our last question, then we can open it up. So uh, if you have your questions ready, how do you know when it's time to change something? Try not to ever get in a situation where you have to have a time to change. So you, I, I think any good organization, who wants to be in a bad organization, any organization should, should always be assessing whether or not they need to change. You're not going to be Super Bowl champion next year if you don't make changes from this year. And, and we can make, I can make a number of analogies. So if you're ever in a situation where you're patting yourself on the back thinking, I got this, you're probably only hurting your arm. And so it's so important that constantly look for ways to improve an individual team. And, and if you do that and you're open to input and you create processes for do that. So I'm a big believer in process. Bad process crushes good people. So if you have a process in an organization where you look at change and you look at what you're doing, is it working, is it not working? We call it assessments in the military probably a similar term here at university, business. We know we have some business leaders here. Um, and, and you're open to input and you have some metrics behind it. It just can't be, oh, the sky's blue today. We're probably doing pretty good. You've got to have some data. People run from numbers, but math is a beautiful thing. And you've got to have some data behind it to help you think through whether you need to change. And um, you know, it's easy in fitness, right? I did 10 push-ups. I want to do 12 tomorrow. Be, you wouldn't stay in the Navy very long if you mm -hmm. could only do 12 push-ups. But you get my point. So change is constant. But is the change necessary? Is the change with, with our priorities? You don't want to start changing just to change. And then that's where people start losing the vision. And the, there's, it becomes a gap between the leader and the team. And when that gap grows, the team's going to be adrift, not, not having a good course set. So, Was there something in your life that you, can you, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but that's what we do, right? Um, where you felt like, I need to change this. That's a hard to point at one thing, but there was a, so I'm pretty far in my career, um, and I was, talking about trust a lot. So this is uh, in a really hard job. And I was uh, well into the job. So military, we rotate every two years, three years. And I was well into the job, maybe one year into the job. And I had a chief of staff. So chief of staff is your sort of go-to person, going to help run everything, make things happen. And we'd meet every morning and every afternoon. And the chief of staff came in. At this point, my career as a two-star admiral, and the chief staff was a retired uh, colonel, so very seasoned person, very savvy person, came in and said, we need to talk. Okay, what do you got? I don't trust you, chief of staff says. I'm like, what, well, just hit me on the blue like this? You don't trust me? Initial reaction was to get a little bit kind of like I did with Captain Woods. What do you mean you don't trust me? What's going on here? I, we work together every day. And he said, I don't think you're listening. I don't think you're listening to my input. And I was a little miffed. So why didn't you bring this to me earlier? It's been going on a long time. Well, I got home that night, and after I thought about it, you know what, I, I shut him out. I didn't trust his input either, if I'm honest with myself. I wasn't listening anymore. We were just going in, and we were taking tasks, things to do, all focused on the things to do 
and, and I was so focused on getting that list of things to do done, and the next list, and the next plan, that I wasn't listening to them. Now, if I had done it right, I would have sat down maybe one month in and said, <coughs> let's have some, the term that's used now is 360 degree feedback, but it's just feedback. What is it that I'm doing, goods and others, and what are you doing? Because there was others, and I hadn't, I hadn't addressed those others with him. I was just letting them go, hmm. and, and letting them go tune, tuned them out. So what that renewed in me, that incident, was the, va the absolute criticality of sitting down with your people and actively listening and having a structured conversation about what's working. Remember, all leadership is about people. It's that two-way thing. It's what I learned from the lady, the two boys. But if you don't make time for that, and it's all project-based, management-based, it's not performance, then you could lose your team. And I had lost them because we were only focused on the project. And I thought by being personal enough and getting around enough, we would we would be able to build that trust, but we weren't dedicating time to human performance. What is our number one resource? Not lithium, not oil, it's not data, it's humans, it's human resource. Well, we, we gotta remember that, and at all stages, you can drift away from that if you're not careful. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, questions? Great morning, Admiral and Dr. Hiller. Thank you for your talk. Leadership is vital. I spent 40 years in the construction industry in various ascending leadership roles. And what I found out is that there's a lot of self-professed leaders, but a general lack of leadership. And my definition, yours is love, mine is service to others. The great Dr. Martin Luther King said, the most prescient question today is, what are you doing to serve others? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think it, putting that into my model, that's the, what are you doing with it? What are you doing? Are you making a difference? It doesn't have to be the big thing. It's just each and every opportunity every day of interacting with somebody else is an opportunity to make a difference. How are we doing at that? Absolutely, that's service. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for being with us today. My question is how do you lead confidently when you're unsure? It's always the toughest questions from the students. <laughs> <laughs> always. I think humility is a really, really important thing. And I think being humble is, is uh, staying confident but not becoming overconfident and the, the word being hubris. So I don't think it's anything wrong with being unsure. I think it's something to embrace. And, and um, maybe a way of expressing it is nobody, wa who wants to be unsure though, right? Nobody wants to be unsure. It's like, <clears throat> who wants to be on a losing team? No, uh, we were, I was participating, I'm, I'm co-teaching a class at FIU on Saturdays, and we're talking about smart power as a way to help the world. And who wants to have dumb power? <laughs> like who wants to? But, but the, the truth is there's a lot we don't know. And everybody, I think, if you're honest with yourself, is unsure about things and knowledge. And so um, just getting over yourself and recognizing that it's okay not to know everything. You're never going to, if you think you know everything, then that's like patting yourself on the back again. You're going to hurt your arm. And, and um, the best leaders that have worked for me and that I've worked for are the ones that are not afraid to admit they don't know something and ask good questions. So how do you get work through that though? Because you don't want to be, you don't want to lack confidence, but you want to have enough confidence to be able to ask a question. So you prepare. I worked for, I mentioned General Mattis. He was Secretary of Defense. I worked for him three times. I feel sometimes that he's sitting on one shoulder and my wife's on the other. <laughs> And he's a great strategist, brilliant mind, very funny, he's written books. The number one thing that I felt that I gained from him was this notion of do your homework. No matter what level you are in an organization or life, do your homework. Get ready, prepare. Don't walk into a meeting and say, all right, what are we talking about today? 
Don't come to class without doing your homework. Don't teach without doing your homework. And, um, and so by doing your homework and preparing, you can help build the knowledge that you need to help with your confidence. That's a big part. And then, and then practicing. You, know, and you wouldn't think about going out to play. If you want to be on a good team, not that bad team, losing team, you wouldn't think about going out and sport tennis or golf or, or any sport and doing well without practice. And so the same comes with knowledge. You've got to rehearse the knowledge. You've got to you study something, you've got to go over it and make sure you've internalized it, whether it's a concept. Uh, you have to know enough to be able to understand. That's a, it's a really thoughtful question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Admiral. My name is Sofia Nava. I'm an international business student here at FAU. And first of all, I just want to thank you for being here and taking time out of your day to come and talk to us about leadership. So my question, I want to take it back to the very beginning of your conversation. You just, you'd said that we really loved um, the mission and vision of FAU, which is student success. So I want to ask you, in your own words, what is success? <clears throat> that, my own words, I, I think that every, much like leadership, you've got to define what student success is for you. So I wouldn't want you to adopt my model, but what I think developing this sort of questioning attitude and almost a day one hunger. So you show up to something your first day, first day new job, first day new club, new sport, first class, lots of questions. What's this about? What are we doing? You need to have that same day one curiosity and hunger on day 1,000, day 10,000. So I think student success is where you really develop this idea of questioning. No, no, there's some things that you don't want to question. One plus one, I think, equals one. But most of the concepts really can be, be rigorously analyzed and thought of and, and questioned and understand. And I think questions and asking good questions are so critical. Uh, Einstein, I, I believe, is credited with this. I credit him with it. My boss used to credit with him. But he would say if he had. Um, 60 minutes to save the world, he'd spend 55 of those 60 minutes defining the problem that we were trying to solve. So what is it, this, uh, what are we trying to do? What is the key question that we want to, to get after? That helps with prioritization, it helps with running a, a, a unit. Um, I think it helps with your studies too. So stay questioning, stay hungry. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel. I'm from the healthcare industry. And over the past couple years, we have lost connection with humanity. Just from the nature of being sheltered in place and all that kind of stuff, how would you say we as leaders can bring back the power of connection? Because I feel like it's contributing to rudeness, incivility, uh, violence, and we're seeing it every day in healthcare. So what can we do as leaders to bring back the importance of connecting with others? No, thank you. I think having the respect is a key part of, of this building trust in organizations. So being able to respect people um, wherever they're coming from doesn't mean you'd agree with them at all, but respecting and then knowing when to and how to talk through that. And I also think, and I was really happy, Nathan, for you to remind me that this is the first in-person leadership event. I know it won't be the last. The, the, the value, there's a lot of goodness that came from us learning how to do some remote work, uh, but the value of getting together and, and really understanding each other. Uh, I think the highlight of my day, every day, at United States Southern Command, I would tell in the morning, I said, it will be a successful day today if I can spend at least 45 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour was the goal, walking around in, in 10 to 20 minute increments. Just, I generally had a plan. No one knew what that plan was. Sometimes I didn't know what it was, but I just walk around and I'll just find people, walk into their office, get one of our, my former uh, teammates, Dewey Turner here is over there, hey, and just say, hey, what's going on? What are you working on? What's happening? And I was generally curious and would usually learn something about them or 
about the team. And after a while, when I did, would do that, people would, 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 hey, we haven't seen you in a while. We've been saving this one for you. <laughs> those, are, those are the dangerous ones. But I just, we can't forget the value of the, of the human interaction. You know? So my, my wife always says people will long forget what exactly you did or decided, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And a lot of that is just, it's just listening and, and, uh, and acting on what you hear, particularly if it's a problem. No. Thank you for the question, Rachel. It was very thoughtful. Hello, Admiral. Time How for one more. Doing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. okay. We've got another person in line. <laughs> I think if I'm, my answers are short, we can knock. Uh, all right. Uh, good. I'm going to, hopefully this is not going to be too, too in-depth here, but I'm, I'm being a mom of four, as you know, I'm always really, at a former teacher, concerned with our youth and their, their mental health, because as you say, love is leadership, and self-love, I think, is the start. So do you have any thoughts or any ideas about changes that you think need to be made with children who are K through 12 and the, the increase in the mental health issues that we're seeing as far as our future leaders are concerned? Well, thank you for the question, Tara. I know Tara, uh, her husband worked for me at Southcom and she works here for FIU um, doing a, a fantastic job. I invest, invest time in, invest time in children, right? So we're, we have five grandchildren of our own and two daughters, and we, we can't say that it's important if we don't invest time in them. And so I think all of us have an obligation to give back, and time is our number, beyond the human resources, time is the number one way we, cho we, cho we choose to give back. And, and so how do, you, how do you do that? Where do you, where do you give time back and, and make a difference with a child? I think that's a big part of it, Tara, but it is an important part of the future. The future is going to be built on all the young, young people that are in school today, here, and elsewhere. Thank you for that question. Was that, was that the end? Was that another one? Yeah, we, can do, we can do another quick one. Yeah, I think sure. right there. Yeah. Yes. She's Good morning, seen. Admiral and Professor Hiller. My name is Margarita Coetzer, and I'm here uh, at FIU working with the Environmental Health and Safety. Um, my question to you is, how do you deal with situations when you're trying to, you know, show your vision, show the way, but you do get pushback. You get like no action. People don't want to work with you. How do you deal with that? I think put, you're going to get pushback if you want to make change. I think big organizations in particular uh, tend to want to continue doing what they have done uh, and even small teams. So, uh, I mean, you try to anticipate that ahead of time. Hey, pushback's going to happen. Maybe think it's the most brilliant idea, but it, it may not go over that way with the team. So collaboration helps with, with, with reducing pushback, I think, bringing people in early, asking them what needs to change. I, when I assumed command of United States Southern Command, I kept hearing about the certain group that, was, that people thought was not functioning well within the command. And I, I, I didn't want to make a judgment. And I didn't want to come in and change the first month so we create a team of, we asked, the, the chief of staff and I asked for the, the nine or so people, we picked an odd number, that were too critical to be taken out of their jobs. It was a trick, right? Oh, here's this person. Okay, we're taking you out of your jobs. So we took about nine people. We said, we're going to give you a month to study some problems and come back with a recommendation. And one of their recommendations was in, in this, they made a number of recommendations and I accepted every one of them. And some of them were really unpopular. And, and after studying them though, there's probably 10 some recommendations, I said, let's have a conversation with the, with the team about how we're gonna implement this. And, and then I said, I understand there's gonna be pushback, but this team also over here helped thought of it. So there was, there was a team behind the, the vision, and so there was less likely, and over time, all the pushback died away, it just kind of went away because of, um, there was more people that believed. So you've got to believe in what you're doing. That's part of loving what you do, and leadership is love. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Please join me in thanking Admiral Fowler for his time and his thoughts and wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It has been 
So 2011 is when we started this journey. We have now had over 15,000 people attend our leadership lectures at the Center for Leadership. And we are just thrilled. And I think it, the reason it keeps coming and working so well is we are just graced with such amazing individuals sharing with us honestly. So thank you so much. And uh, please join us for a reception now uh, in the atrium. And we look forward to connecting with you. Thank you for being here today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.